Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Feel Younger and Genetic Insights, Owen Robinson. And today we are discussing how our genetics impact our reproductive and sexual health. So tell me, Owen, why did you want to talk about this topic today? Well, honestly, um, it's something that I haven't, why well, I hadn't focused on a lot myself because it seemed to be one of the only areas where I have never had any issues and we'll discuss why that is in a second. Um, but of course, a couple of companies that I am involved with, uh, one of them is called the New Alpha, uh, I, I am formulating products for this purpose, for helping people with you know sexual dysfunction, Low, de- low libido, uh, low testosterone, all of those kind of things. And so because of that, I've come across quite a few clients who do have those kind of issues. As I know, you've worked with uh, people from that company as well, Chrissy, and worked with a lot of them. And it is interesting um, because a lot of people, you know, if, it's, if they talk about like their heart health, or their chance of blood sugar issues, or I don't know, arthritis, or all these kind of things, there's a kind of quite a clear understanding that genetics do play a significant role, right? I might well have that issue because of my ancestors did, and it's been passed down to me. When it comes to sexual stuff, I think there's very much generally a belief that you're on your own when it comes to that one. However you are, whatever your sex drive is, whatever your libido is, whatever your ability to reproduce is, whatever your ability, your sexual function is, all of these things are down purely to you and your lifestyle and uh, you know the choices that you've made and are making. And I don't want to diminish that because, of course, it is good to focus more on lifestyle in general and, and what you can do because these are things that you can control. However... As we've talked about before in episodes where we've talked about genetics, we do have to understand that each of us have been dealt a different hand, as it were, by life, by our genes, by God, whoever we want to see it. And for some people, some things are more difficult than others. And I feel like it's very helpful to recognize if some challenge you're having, whether it's low testosterone or low progesterone or uh, low libido or issues of sexual function or ability to reproduce, potency, fertility, all those kind of things may actually have a genetic component because it means that you can be uh, maybe less hard on yourself if you tend to be, oh God, why am I such a, you know, like, or what did I do to myself maybe in my youth that made me this way or whatever it might be, like you can go, oh, well actually, based on my genetics, I am more likely to have an issue with that. And everyone has an issue with something. I just want to make that clear. So, you know, it was very interesting for me to go through these reports because sexual function is one of the things that I had not had an issue with, maybe maybe once or twice in my youth (laughs) because of my level of, uh, like, anxiety or whatever. But um, it had never been a problem, despite me suffering all kinds of other problems. And it sounds like I'm boasting when I say that, but... No, no, I'm not boasting. Like, I had all kinds of issues that I'm quite embarrassed about that I have talked about publicly. I suffered from several health issues which predominantly only happen to women, which I've, you know, freely, uh, you know, talked about in this podcast. Um, I've, uh, you know, I'm not very resilient to stress, and I've admitted that very time, many times on this and many other podcasts. That doesn't make me very manly, I know. It's just the way it is. I suffered from a lot of anxiety. That's not very manly. It's just the way it is. It's just... Uh, it just happened to not be something that was an issue for me. And I always wondered about that. And when I actually started looking at my genetic reports about sexual function, I saw that, oh, it actually is in my genes that I am very unlikely to have issues with that. I'd have, I'd have to be really bad to have issues with that. Uh, whereas some things I have issues with very easily. I've talked about this a lot, like sinuses or digestion. It doesn't take, all I have to do is be a few points away from optimal. Like if I'm operating at 95% rather than 100%, I might straight away start getting sinus issues or I might straight away start getting digestive issues or straight away start getting thyroid issues or uh, excessive cortisol issues, all kinds of things. Everyone has something like that. This is what I've seen, you know, seeing hundreds of people's um, uh, genetic profile by now and looking through their reports and all the rest of it. 
everyone has some things where if they're anything other than optimal, problems start to show up. For some people, it's more mental, emotional health. For some people, it's more physical. And yeah, for plenty of people, it can be sexual function. That is one of the first things to fail. You know, for women, it's often low libido, uh, low desire. For men, it's often low, you know, issues with ability to uh, function sexually. And so, uh, although it can be both ways for men and women. And so, if you do have a strong genetic tendency for that, it is really helpful to know that that's the case and to know that actually this is just one of the you know, areas that shows up first. It's not ideal. I know men especially, it really uh, drags them down. It really makes them feel a lot of frustration and shame and all the rest of it. And I don't know if you would say that it's the same for women, Chrissy, but um, I'm sure it is as well to various degrees. I think especially maybe more fertility, that's even more of a, like a pain point um, for women at a certain age, uh, especially. And so uh, to, to understand that there is a genetic basis to these things. And also sometimes there is no genetic basis. So for instance, for me, uh, one of the areas I guess that I was not optimal in terms of sexual performance is I've got a fairly long refractory period. Well, it turns out that, you know, one of the biggest things that controls that is prolactin. And I've had high prolactin for a while now, and I've talked about that in previous episodes. Now, if I look at my genetic reports for prolactin, there is no genetic tendency to have high prolactin. So that's good for me to know that that's not just the way I am. That's something, there's something wrong. <laughs> there's something that needs to be addressed. And I've talked about that before, the various strategies that I'm employing. I won't talk about that again. Uh, right now. But so that's helpful. So either way, it's helpful. And I realize that in order for it to be helpful that way, you kind of have to believe the genetic reports first. And so I encourage people to go through and you'll see how accurate they are. And then you can start, you know, taking in and believing these distinctions about, oh, this report says I don't have a genetic tendency. So that I believe that that must mean that there's something more environmental lifestyle wise versus, oh, this, this report says I have a strong genetic tendency. So I can let myself off the hook about that a little bit and just accept that that's, uh, that's potentially the way it is. Right. Okay. Yeah. That makes, makes some really good points. And you do speak very truthfully to, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure on individuals for whether it's a performance or, you know, as you mentioned, fertility of how that can make you feel you know, less than in a way, which then puts more stress, undue pressure, and then just goes into this vicious, vicious cycle. And so, you know, what I'm hearing is by looking at those reports, it can kind of help, help you identify, also help you understand yourself a little bit more and see if there are potential areas that you need to work on. Yeah. And I guess I've left that till last, but as you said, Chrissy, that's, you know, the most helpful thing about it. And that's, really want to want to talk about as well today of course is um that it can give you clues about what you can actually do about it so uh you know in my case as i said if if i had an issue with this particular issue i can look at the genetic reports and go okay could it be this could it be this could it be this and so that's actually what i want to do today is um so if you have no access to your genetic reports with us and you have no intention of doing that with us or anyone else who offers something similar then fair enough uh, my goal is that you'll still learn a lot from this episode because I'm going to be teaching not just about genetics, but about all the different factors that can lead to all the common sexual, reproductive and fertility problems. So I'll be mentioning the genetic impact, but I'll also talk about all the different factors that you should be aware of. And this is important as well, because I think a lot of the time uh, when we have an issue like I think the mainstream often just tells us like there's one potential cause for this issue. And then when we try and work at it from that angle and then it doesn't work, it's very easy to feel hopeless or like it's not possible to improve the situation. Uh, but of course, actually, usually there are many potential causes for, you know, whatever particular issue you're struggling with. And that includes whatever sexual uh, issue or reproductive issue you may be struggling with. If you're wondering why we're using clinical words as we are, we are on YouTube here, so we have to be careful. We're not gonna uh, you know, use very strong words. We're gonna use scientific language here. I know we're on Spotify and other things as well, but we, we get a lot of um, people see us on YouTube. So we're gonna try and be as uh, 
as well, conservative and clinical about this as possible, while still being as helpful as possible. <laughs> very, very true. Um, so, you know, getting into it, really, it's... I don't know that a lot of people really think, oh, genetics, uh, you know, uh, you know, your sexual performance per se, maybe definitely in the reproductive space and, you know, our certain genes and other things that we've got going on. But what is the role of the genetics, of our genetics in human sexuality as you see it? Um, well, I, I'll break it down into uh, four areas. We'll, we'll look at four areas today. So first of all, I would look at libido. We did a whole episode on libido, which I would refer people to, that we really go in depth about that, but we'll, we'll talk about it, um, what's the word, like a summary of that episode today, along with the other three points. Um, so libido is the desire for sex in the first place. I would really start with that and you know the, the level of that. Uh, second, we'll look at sexual function and dysfunction. So uh, within that, as I said, that tends to be more of an issue for men. Libido tends to be more of an issue for women, even though both can have an issue of either. Um, and so because of that, we'll probably focus a bit more on men's issues when it comes to sexual function and dysfunction. Um, then number three is fertility and potency. And so those are just the male and female version of, you know, the ability to reproduce, I would say. And then lastly, we'll look a little bit at, at the reproductive uh, process itself, as in making babies. Um, and if there's a genetic tendency around being able to do that successfully or not. Wonderful. I definitely, since, um, you know, you've introduced genetic insights to me and I've been looking at my reports, it's been one of the things that as you're putting together these categories that you are, that I really didn't understand that certain things can impact other things, especially, you know, as we were just discussing and doing this episode today, that how, you know, I was like, oh, interesting that that can correlate or may affect this, you know, so that's where I'm going to take my next questions, you know, really, what are the types of things that our genetics determine when it comes to our sexuality? I mean, like, can it even, <clears throat> excuse me, can it even go so, so far as to determine whether we're monogamous or things like that? Yeah, we, we don't have, uh, you know, will your husband or wife cheat on you report? Um, <laughs> or, uh, you know, are you more likely to be the cheater yourself? Um, yeah, I would say that definitely is more due to, you know, up, upbringing and life, lifestyle and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, we do have a report on, uh, what's the word? Not recklessness, but um, being uh, risk-taking. So potentially if someone scores high genetically in risk-taking, they might be uh, more likely to do that. Uh, you could say if someone scores higher in, you know, sex drive and libido in general, that they may be more likely to be uh, unfaithful because, um, I don't know, just simply they're going to have more desire to have sex full stop. So I guess it's more likely to spread. Um, but yeah, no, there's no report about, I guess, you know, the, the key, uh, those are kind of peripheral. I mean, the key parts of uh, uh, cheating and stuff like that would be dishonesty and, um, if there is, uh, if there are genetic factors related to that, which I think there are, I mean, you know, psychopathy, for instance, Machiavellianism, um, narcissism, what are called the dark triad in psychology. Uh, so psychopathy especially is related to, uh, again, recklessness, like doing things without thinking of long-term consequences. Machiavellianism is related to manipulation, scheming, uh, self-serving behavior. Narcissism is relate, related around, you know, um, feeling like you are the center of the universe and you're the only one who really matters. All of those kind of traits, which really would lend themselves to make you more likely to cheat. Um, there is a genetic component to them, but we don't have a report telling you if you're more likely to have any of those things. I would like there to be, um, I would love I would love it if we could run those tests on people before they were able to, for instance, hold political office um, or have areas of responsibility where they have people's lives in their hands. And, you know, I'd like to know if people have a genetic tendency to those traits before I hire them. 
Uh, I, uh, you know, as an employee, I know that people would say that's unfair because just because someone has a genetic tendency doesn't mean that they are necessarily manifesting it. So I suppose yeah, that's the a only good point. Yeah. Re- truly fair way of doing it. Yeah, the only true, fairly, only true way, truly fair way of applying it would be um, that if a person has a genetic tendency, then they would be required to submit to actual psychological testing to see if they actually <laughs> have those uh, dark triad yeah. Uh, well, there, there are certain professions levels. where they... But anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. Definitely. But there are certain professions that definitely do make you have psychological evaluations prior to taking on those jobs. So I see where you're coming at. I mean, yeah, especially when, um, you know, you're inviting somebody into your world, into your life, into your business, it's going to have a major impact, you know. But yeah, definitely tangent, but we'll, we'll shift it back. I'm, I'm sure... I'm sure there's a lot of men and women out there who wish they'd have been able to run those tests on whatever <laughs> dating platform yes. or you know, whether they met <laughs> someone before they got involved in them. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But anyway, yeah, no, unfortunately, that's not a service we can provide. <laughs> no, not at this stage. <laughs> um, so, okay, so then moving on into, you know, um, what are some of the genetic predispositions that someone may have that can affect, you know, sexual function that they may not even think could be a determining factor? Uh, yeah, well, so in the reports, there's kind of obvious stuff. So, you know, we will have report on um, sexual function, which really relates to specifically sexual um, desire. We have a report related to erectile dysfunction, uh, for instance. Um, but, you know, beyond that, there's other things that I would look at. So one specific thing would be stress. Stress is a huge factor that can suppress sexual function because generally if a person's in a fight or flight survival state, sexual and reproduction, in most cases, not all, but in most cases is considered a kind of a luxury function. And so that will diminish in most cases the only exception the reason i say there's exception to that is because there is a little bit of a a theory that those who truly feel like life is going to be short actually go into accelerated sexual function so for instance um i know there's research that shows that girls who grow up in a household where there's no father or uh like male paternal role model are more likely to go into uh get their period earlier like a year or two earlier than those who don't so again because the environment is deemed to be more dangerous so they're like going into sexual function earlier i've seen it as well in men um that sometimes they go into like a hypersexuality uh if they perceive that they're they don't have long to live for instance so there is that possibility but With that exception admitted, generally, if you feel like your life is on the line, you are not going to be as interested in sex. And so, uh, and also, sexual, even if you are interested in sex, theoretically, like in your mind, in your head, you may well not be as capable of it because your body is in a, we don't have time for that, we're just struggling to stay alive kind of state. And that stress could be brought on by all kinds of things, um, but there can, of course, be a genetic tendency for it. So stress... And the signs of that are one of the things that I look at. Uh, nutritional deficiencies are always something I look at. I don't look at too many of those with sexual function, but there is a couple, um, like zinc, for instance, would probably be my number one if someone has an elevated need for... How does zinc interplay in that? What, what, what function is zinc doing to help? Uh, so it's both you know, an essential component of uh, testosterone, and I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about hormones in a minute because they're big. And it's also uh, an essential part of having um, healthy reproductive function in terms of, you know, sperm quality, um, uh, you know, fertility, the um, the ability to have a, uh, a smooth uh, menstrual cycle, all of that kind of stuff. So now, all basically every vitamin, every vitamin, every mineral, every amino acid, every essential fat. Any of those that are low or suboptimal can create problems in general, including a sexual function. But sometimes I pick, I pick on like a few which are specifically important. Zinc would be one of them. Uh, vitamin D3 would be another one. And then uh, carnitine would uh, be another one again. And those would generally be um, often included in those kind of formulas that are trying to increase 
sexual desire, sexual function, sexual potency, fertility, uh, because they're specifically supportive of that. Even though, um, you know, as I said, the, the best nutrient that's going to give you the best sexual function is the one that you need the most, <laughs> which is, you know, hard to ascertain without thorough testing. But still, like generally, zinc is, you know, commonly, uh, uh, you know, as an example, is commonly one that a lot of men specifically are low on. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it, I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have from most articles. So, to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code RejuvenateMe for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code RejuvenateMe at feelyounger.net. You mentioned testing. And so, you know, for me, if I go, oh, yeah, my zinc's low, I wouldn't have no idea that zinc is, you know, essential for producing testosterone. I would just be like, oh, yeah, I got low, low zinc. You know, I wouldn't correlate those two. So as you bring that together, because I know, you know, the more we dig into things, you know, understanding the rate limiting factor, if we don't have enough of those essential amino acids or other amino acids or cofactors for certain processes. So that's why I'm really happy that we're doing this, because that's that was my... Um, my intrigue for going, oh, actually, I had no idea that zinc correlated to potential sexual function fertility. I know it's really important, but understanding that it's not, it doesn't just do one thing. It has multiple layers that are associated with it. So I'm, gl I'm glad you're bringing this up. That's great. So you mentioned zinc, you mentioned carnitine, and you mentioned one other that I, I it's gone out of my head now. But, but yeah, so I'm glad you're bringing this to the forefront. Yeah, vitamin D, vitamin D3. I mean, you could mention the magnesium as well. Again, every nutrient potentially, if you are low on it, it could um, create problems of sexual function, fertility, and all the rest of it. I just picked like the two or three that I see the most commonly, um, and also where there's the most research supporting that it specifically supports sexual and reproductive function. Um, so yeah, I'd say those 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 three would be a good starting place. And then you know more than anything else, I would look at. Uh, hormones and so I'd say we have more reports on that than anything else in the um, sexual and reproductive function area and that's because obviously hormones especially sex hormones um, which are the steroid hormones so your body has this thing called cholesterol which I think we've all heard of this type of fat uh, created in the liver also eaten in the diet and it converts that into a hormone called pregnenolone, which is considered to be the master steroid hormone. And out of that, your body makes all the other, both um, sex and also adrenal hormones. Um, all the other sex and adrenal steroid hormones, which is most of the sex and adrenal hormones, including the ones that most people have probably heard of, like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and maybe some other ones that you haven't heard of, <laughs> unless you listen to this podcast, but which are super important, like DHEA or pregnenolone, uh, allopregnenolone or uh, DHT, which uh, we've you know done a whole episode on recently. So finding out about all of those hormones is very, very important. Just to explain this and to go back and explain the nutrient needs as well, a genetic report cannot tell you if you have too much or too little of a hormone, and a genetic report cannot tell you if you need more or less of a nutrient. But what it can say is what you have a genetic tendency towards. So for instance, if I see that most men um, are already lowish on zinc, they already have suboptimal levels of zinc, and then I work with a man and I see he has a genetic report that says that he has a specific tendency to need more zinc than the average person. Maybe he needs twice as much as the average person. That's pretty common. So I can go, well, the average man is not getting enough. Then if you're the average man plus you need twice as much as the average man, then you're almost certainly not getting enough. So I can make a calculation like that, if that makes sense. And then 
Still, because zinc is something that you can overdo, I would ideally have the person test still to make sure that they need the zinc, especially if they've been supplementing high levels of zinc already, because again, it is possible to overdo it. But, you know, generally, especially if they haven't been supplementing zinc, you can put them on, you know, 10, 20 milligrams of zinc, which is not a crazy amount, maybe even more. And generally, it's, you know, very beneficial for them. So that's the value of it. And even though with hormones, it is more complicated, it's the same basic principle. The genetic report cannot tell you if you definitely need more of any specific hormone or, or less, but it can tell you of a genetic tendency. So for instance, we know a lot of men these days have suboptimal levels of testosterone. You may or may not also know that a lot of women have suboptimal levels of progesterone. I hope you know, because we tried to raise awareness of that in, in this podcast. Um, so, and in fact, even men often uh, would benefit from more progesterone in certain cases, specifically the cases where they're running very high in stress. And so um, that's generally true. So if you take the fact that that's generally true and then you add the fact, oh, well, most men generally have too low testosterone compared to what would be optimal, and then you specifically, for instance, have a tendency to low testosterone, then we can go, mm, it would be worth you testing to see if you actually do have suboptimal levels of testosterone, given that a lot of men do, and you have a genetic tendency towards it. So, you know, it's helpful in that regard. It's not prescriptive, it's not diagnostic, but it is, it gives a strong tendency and it gives the justification to go to your doctor and ask for further tests or pay for further tests. Um, and it can be life-changing. I mean, testosterone is not particularly hard to get, but DHT, for instance, which we'll talk about, that's a test that is pretty rare. The doctor will rarely order it, um, except for if they think you have too much. Uh, so certainly they will rarely order it if just because you think you might have too little. But if you, for instance, have a genetic report back, like I did, that said you have a genetic tendency to have low DHT, then you can go, huh, all right, maybe it is worth paying for or pushing my doctor for getting that specific test to see if it actually is low in real life. And uh, I've had several cases, not, not just my own, where that with DHT specifically, and then lots of cases when we talk about all the hormones, where getting that initial genetic data then led to the person being willing or having a doctor be willing to do further tests that then brought up very, very important information. And so back to hormones, the reason why these hormones are so important is because they're really the fundamental thing that controls how you feel. They're not the only thing, of course. So how you feel on a more moment to moment basis, a lot of that is down to the amount of energy you have. And it's down to your level of these things called neurotransmitters, things you may have heard of like dopamine, and GABA and serotonin and all of those kind of things. But the thing is, it's quite difficult to measure those things because they change so quickly. Um, Adrenaline is another one. It's quite hard to measure them. And it's also quite hard to control them just with neurotransmitters. So uh, a better strategy usually, rather than working on the level of the neurotransmitters, is to work on the level of hormones. And I guess that's quite theoretical. So to give a practical application of that, let's go to the first one on the list there, which was libido. Yes, exactly. And, um, and I also do want to circle back because you were talking about, you know, if it's, if a, you know, a man was to get, look at his genetic reports and see potentially as low DHT or low T, you know, how important as well is that for a woman, if she sees that on her reports that she goes to a doctor and say, Hey, I'm, I'm worried about this, you know, how, Im how impactful is that going to be into her life too? So low DHT and low T, um, generally, if you go to a doctor, doctor like uh, the one that only cares if you might have something really bad, they are not going to care. You, but however, there are plenty of hormone optimization doctors who will care. And usually, um, testosterone is often given, is given frequently to women, small amounts who are on bioidentical hormones, especially once they've reached a certain age. It's usually given uh, for two reasons. Number one, the most important reason is for sex drive. So often, so yeah, to do a bit of a digression on this then before we get to libido, uh, when women get to a kind of pre-menopausal age, 
which is what does menopause mean? It means when the sex hormones start to really crater, like the levels of them start to go really low, and as a result, or maybe correlated with, this is still an area of debate in my mind, um, their fertility basically stops. When I say it's debate in my mind, I'm not 100% convinced that you run out of eggs and therefore your hormones go low. I, I wonder if it's actually your hormones go low and therefore right. you stop producing eggs. But anyway, point. either way, um, they, 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 they definitely go together. And so one of the hormones that does go low is testosterone. It's certainly not the first hormone that a, any doctor, including an optimization doctor, is going to look at increasing for a woman. But it might be one of the ones they do. And so very commonly what I see most commonly is that other than, you know, non-sex hormones like thyroid or, uh, you know, insulin or whatever, um, when it comes to sex hormones, usually doctors give women progesterone, which is the most important one, um, and then also a small amount of testosterone. And the progesterone is for overall health, anti-stress, um, balance, uh, emotional health, all that kind of stuff. We, we've done whole episodes on this, so I'm trying to you know, <laughs> skip ahead a little bit. Uh, but the testosterone they give specifically for sex drive. That's the, uh, you know, the main reason they give it. And the secondary reason they give it, and women do talk about this as well, uh, experientially, who are on bioidenticals, I know, is for confidence and assertiveness. So, you know, women who are feeling like, mm, you know, it's it's maybe, you know, timid, and it's hard for me to assert myself, and I, I struggle to ask for what I want, and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, stand up for myself. Often, when they're on a little bit of bioidentical testosterone, they're like, oh, <laughs> there's a bit less of that now. It's a bit easier to be assertive and to talk about, you know, this is what I want, and stuff like that. And that really goes hand in hand with um, the aggressive aspects of the sex drive. And what does that mean, the aggressive aspect of the sex drive? It means the part of you that kind of desire sex as opposed to the part of you that's receptive to sex. So this is my understanding. Not everyone agrees with this these days. I'd love to hear you. That's a really great point. And I'd love to hear you elaborate just a little on that right before we get into libido. The desire versus the receptivity. Well, it's. I guess it's related. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's related to it. It's part of libido, right? So the obvious part of libido is the desire I want to go and get sex. I want to go and have sex. It's kind of like a moving towards kind of feeling. But the other part of it is also the, uh, I'm ready if you are, like I'm here, <laughs> I'm good to go. <laughs> so that's the receptive part of it. And so the um, proactive, I guess, is probably a better word than aggressive because people have negative associations of aggressive. The proactive aspect of libido is the testosterone, but the receptive part is related, my understanding is, to estrogen. And so this is why, like, some people, especially in my kind of natural health community, demonize estrogen these days. And it's certainly true, estrogen is generally not great. But it is also true that when uh, women have really low estrogen, they often... Um, lack that receptive sex drive and also on a very practical level they lack any kind of lubrication to have sex and so even bioidentical hormones doctors who are dead against estrogen will still give women like the weakest form of estrogen um, called estrone to apply uh, intervaginally just to give them a little bit of uh, uh, that ability to receive again you know very, very literally on a practical level uh, but it's actually true for men as well so Men with erectile dysfunction, um, one, there, there is a category of men with erectile dysfunction who have high testosterone but very low estrogen. And that is also correlated with erectile dysfunction in studies. So, um, whereas men who have high testosterone and high estrogen tend to not suffer with erectile dysfunction. Now, high estrogen does create other problems. So, probably an optimal is high testosterone and medium to medium low estrogen in reality but just if the estrogen goes too low then it, you know it's still that receptive thing so you you know you might be like oh yeah yeah i really want to but then when it actually comes to it there's there's nothing there and i'm not saying that's not it's not the most common reason for erectile dysfunction really probably it mainly happens among men who are using steroids and things to artificially increase testosterone too much but it's well known that if you 
yeah, if the testosterone goes high and the estrogen goes too low, then you know your ability to actually have sex goes down. Physic- the so physical, estrogen, the physical uh, part. The physical part. So yeah, for the physical part, for men and women, I guess that's the bottom line. You do need some estrogen, even if it's not particularly uh, a lot. And and so yeah, so the the proactive and the receptive, and both sexes need both. Obviously, the proactive is considered more masculine and the receptive is considered more feminine um, but the reality is that both need both to some degree and so women definitely do need a bit of testosterone to, to have a libido and men also need a bit of estrogen to be able to perform. Let me ask you this because there is a lot out, out there as well about you know estrogen dominance you know at having too much estrogen and I know we talk about that being receptive I don't necessarily potentially see that too much estrogen is like yes open for business or anything so what impact does that too high of a level of estrogen potentially show up as? This is a really controversial one uh, it may seem like a simple question so Estrogen is one of those things, like serotonin, that kind of a certain thing was thought about it and it's now being really rethought and reconsidered as if it's actually what we thought it was. Um, so with serotonin, just you know, quickly, it used to be considered to be the happy hormone, which is why, uh, or happy neurotransmitter, which is why they would freely give drugs out that increase serotonin to increase happiness. Um, but sometimes increasing serotonin creates all kinds of other effects like violence and wanting to end your own life and, you know, feeling extremely emotionally flat, something that's very common. So it's not as simple as that. So estrogen is another one that I'm not going to give a definitive what it is, but I'll say it's not as simple as that, certainly. So estrogen used to be thought of as the female hormone and the feminine hormone. So it would lead to, uh, feminine traits. So... Um, if a girl who is prepubescent, um, never had any estrogen, then she would not develop a lot of feminine traits. She would not, um, have, uh, you know, curves, curves, the hips, she would not develop breasts. She would not develop any of those kind of, um, obvious indicators of femininity. And I believe that's still the, uh, mainstream perspective and understanding of it. Um, now... Estrogen does lead to that receptivity, but there is also some kind of research coming out that actually perhaps it also, uh, on an emotional level, leads to kind of, um, what's the word, like uh, an imbalance, so an emotional imbalance, whereas progesterone will tend to lead to more of an emotional balance. So because estrogen is kind of a stress chemical. I say kind of a stress chemical. It's not as obviously a stress chemical as adrenaline. Um, so there is this thing, and you know, the men watching this will probably laugh. I don't know if the women are gonna hate me for it, but there is this idea that like, uh, the more attractive the woman is, the more crazy she is. And I think that actually is true. And I think actually probably there is a male version where it's also true because, um, the more estrogen a woman has in relation to progesterone, the more she probably is gonna have up and down mood swings. And the more estrogen a woman has, the more that she's gonna to tend to have feminine traits and the more she's gonna be sexually receptive. So there is that correlation. It's very controversial to say. Um, I don't know if we get enough viewers that I'm gonna get in trouble with this, probably not, but- uh, <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> um, maybe if someone finds this years from now eventually. Um, but, uh, you know, honestly, as I said, I think there is a male equivalent to that as well. Um, if a man has high levels of testosterone, especially if it's not converting well to DHT, which we'll get to, um, then often, and especially if, if a large amount, if not enough is converting to DHT and if a significant amount is converting to estrogen, it can really be the same thing. The difference being that, um, you know, the man will be more aggressive and assertive in his craziness, whereas the woman will be more maybe, you know, recept receptive and manipulative rather than overtly aggressive in their craziness. Um, but both of them <laughs> have a potential for craziness. I would say, uh, you know, the, the, the f quote unquote female hormone, although both of them have it, that really keeps that craziness at bay. And but But potentially, and this is the the downside that no one wants to hear, and I may be wrong about, I'm not saying this is definitely the truth, but this is the kind of conclusion I'm starting to come to, um, 
the hotness, the sexual attractiveness of someone may um, um, be exacerbated by that as well as the level of, um, what's the word, emotional volatility. Whereas the progesterone will um, reduce the emotional volatility, but it might reduce the obvious feminine traits in women. And then, um, you know, the potentially the conversion of testosterone to DHT and also, um, instead of estrogen will um, maybe reduce the masculine traits a little bit in men because um, it's less anabolic. So, you know, there, there won't have as big muscles and maybe they won't be as you know, exciting or whatever, but they'll be more cool and calm and relaxed and, and all the rest of it. So basically both men and women have um, like a male and female quote unquote hormone that makes them more calm and relaxed and emotionally balanced. And both of them potentially have a tendency as well to be imbalanced. And so uh, there's maybe, uh, maybe that correlation. As I said, this is not settled or whatever, but I, I do, I do find it, I do find uh, these correlations uh, a little bit interesting. So uh, there's a fine balance. To, what was the question? <laughs> so there's a fine balance, is my understanding of the male and the female hormones, essentially. Yeah, and so yeah, oh yeah, it was about estrogen dominance, right? Yes, so, yes. Um, I would say that the downside of estrogen dominance is worse for women than men. Um, it's easier to get to a position of estrogen dominance. However, uh, by the time they're in their 40s and 50s, especially if they're significantly overweight, men can have just as much of a problem. In fact, it kind of flips the other way. So men will um, keep, even though the testosterone goes, does go down, even though it is lower these days than it ever has been in recorded history, still a 60-year-old man will make a lot more sex hormones than a six-year-old woman if they're not being supported um, by exogenous hormones. That's pretty much universal rule. So if men is still making a fair bit of testosterone, even though it's a lot less than before, whereas a woman is really making hardly any estrogen or progesterone because she's already been through the menopause, then a certain amount of that testosterone that a man is still making will be converted to estrogen. So that's how we can easily end up in a situation where, especially post-menopause, in a couple, the man actually has more estrogen than the woman. The man is more <laughs> emotionally unbalanced. The man is more, uh, you know, whatever. So that's that's a situation that uh, you can potentially um, that you can potentially get into quite easily. So estrogen dominance more of an issue with women when they're younger. Estrogen dominance is more of an issue with men when they're older. It is, you know, problematic in both cases. With women, as I said, it's. I, I'm also I'm kind of in the middle, right? I don't think estrogen in high amounts is good, like the mainstream old perspective is, but I don't think it's a purely bad thing either, as I've also said. I think having low to medium levels is probably ideal for both men and women. Um, with women, it's especially important that the progesterone is high in relation to estrogen, and that's you know not estrogen dominance. And in men, it's important that their testosterone is high in relation to estrogen, which as a Kind of, which would imply that the testosterone is being kept as testosterone or converted to something else like DHT instead of estrogen. Usually, DHT isn't tested, so we kind of we can assume that the testosterone high, estrogen isn't very high. I would assume that more of it is converted into DHT, and I would assume that the man is feeling better and is a bit more emotionally balanced. I do have a question because you mentioned just there about um, that men will be producing more, you know, than women later at stage. Is it just because we go through menopause that that is? Or is it, you know, what, why, why is that? And why do we go through menopause? What's going on? Is it just because our hormones are going so low that that, that it's just a, what occurs for us? It's a good question. And again, it's a topic that probably if you were to ask a mainstream doctor, they would consider it is settled science and just give you, you know, an answer. But uh, I don't think it is. So uh, as far as I'm aware, you know, if you want to categorize humans as another primate or a type of primate, even if you believe that we're every different type of primate that's blessed by God or whatever, all I'm saying is that it's kind of the closest, you know, other animal that exists. So if we look at other primates, uh, my understanding is that they don't go through menopause. Now, you could say that they don't live long enough, and that's the 
you know, the lifespan, million dollar the question, lifespan that, question that, that there. Scientists yeah. will potentially disagree about. Um, but you know, there are stories, both anecdotally and you know, even biblically and stuff like that, about uh, and you know, in in a lot of cultures where. There was a belief that there would, you know, be a certain elite that would live for a very long time and stay healthy for a very long time. I'm talking about, you know, things like uh, Taoist. And I'm talking about, and you know, in India and in ancient Egypt, like all these places throughout the world where there was kind of stories of these people who would live a long time. And as I said, in in biblical history as well, that uh, there are women who were still able to reproduce well into their 60s, 70s, 80s, and, you know, maybe even beyond. So these are only stories. I don't, they've not been scientifically validated. But it seems to me that there is no good reason why women go through that. And I have heard people share the theory that menopause is not inevitable um, and that it is simply a result of suboptimal living so it's not a genetic factor either because obviously all women in modern day go through it um i think one of the things that probably provides a fair amount of evidence for that is that as our level of health and well-being and lifestyle has crashed i guess got worse and worse for instance with the obesity epidemic over the last four decades uh men more and more men are going through a kind of male equivalent of the andropause, as they call it, the male version of the menopause, which was, you know, not considered to be a thing until before. Now you could say, oh, well, yeah, but it's not the same, and a man can still impregnate a woman in his 90s. Yeah, okay, not every man, you know, there are many, many men these days who can't, not only at 90s, but in their 80s, their 70s, their 60s, because they can't even get an erection, let alone impregnate a woman right so there does seem to be a situation where as our environment and our lifestyles become less and less optimal that more and more men are going through a equivalent of the menopause so that gives credibility to me to the theory that it would be possible that if women were in a truly optimal environment that they also uh, either wouldn't go through a menopause or that it would be much more um, subtle, like it would be a gradual decline that you that was inevitable, but rather than the sharp drop, which is what it currently generally is. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, you and I know women who are uh, fairly healthy in their late 50s, right, who I believe are still, you know, um, having gone through a menopause, right, through various... Uh, biohacking or whatever you would want to call it so you know i don't know what the limits are but you know even from our experience we know that it's probably a bit further than people uh, suspect it is it may be pointless to what's the word pontificate on it because our lifestyle is what it is we're not going back to some kind of maybe it never existed garden of eden type of you know optimal situation and so maybe it is what it is uh, there's all kinds of theories about, you know, how not just religious, but scientific about how the earth used to be fundamentally different and more abundant and maybe more supportive of life. Maybe there's a lot more CO2 in the environment. And there's evidence, for instance, that high levels of CO2 really extend lifespan and, you know, extend health and stuff like that among different like other species where two different, you know, like uh, I think it's rats, for instance, um, ones that are in a high CO2 environment, they last a lot longer and they seem like way more um, healthy than with a low CO2 environment. So there may be stuff about our environment that even isn't our fault. There's nothing to do with, you know, 5G and smoking and processed food and all that. There might be stuff, you know, like the level of CO2 or the level of whatever that we have no control over that have meant that all of this is inevitable. I don't know that. Um, I don't think if anyone, don't know if anyone knows for sure. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that it is necessarily... A given, Chrissy, and I definitely don't think that you would expect it must happen by a certain age. You know, as I said, based on the experience we've had and all the anecdotal uh, stories about it. Now, a lot of people would say, well, Ellen, you know, so what? Like, do you really want to have a baby when you're 55? Well, again, we, we know women who have done that, right? Uh, is it a good idea? I, I mean, that's a judgment, I guess, depends if in, if in 30 years they're still, yeah, 
they, they may be healthier and happier and a better parent in 30 years than a lot of parents who are 20 years younger than them, right? We don't know that. That's a, that's a judgment, but, but that's you know, hard to say for sure. But uh, the point is, you may not want to reproduce. You probably, you know, wouldn't want to have another baby in 10 years' time or whatever, Chrissy, but, uh, or 20 years' time. But it's more that, like, um, f not being able to and having had those changes in your body that mean that you're not able to, that's not ideal. Because, of course, along with the not being able to have a baby also comes the crashing exactly. hormones that make you feel good, that make you resilient to stress, that make you happy, that make you enjoy life. And that's really more the key issue. Precisely. I couldn't have said it better myself. So no, that's exactly it. Well, great. That was, thank you so much for going down that rabbit hole with me. Um, so yes, let's get to the first on our list who's really looking at libido and how our genetics affect it. Yeah. So we did talk about this a lot. So libido obviously is a form of desire. That's the first thing to be really clear on. And then uh, what is desire? So desire, I would say, fundamentally comes down to dopamine. Now, that's if we look at desire as um, a move, I want to move towards, I want to have that, I want to do that. If it's like a positive moving towards feeling, you could also say that fear is a desire because it's a desire to get away from something. So fear is different. Desire to get away from something that's more like adrenaline, no adrenaline maybe, maybe fight or get away from something maybe. But if it's like, I want that, I want that person, I want that experience, I want that food, I want that whatever, that's dopamine. And so that absolutely includes sex. And so I want sex, that's down to dopamine more than anything. Now, having said that, you can have too much dopamine, that means that you are no longer able to have it. <laughs> this happens to people really too, a too much that dopamine. Stimulate dopamine. Right, too much dopamine means uh uh, not gonna happen. I'm thinking of like super physiological levels, I'm thinking of amphetamine, you know, and, and stuff like that that uh, can really, yeah, push people. <laughs> um, no matter how much something helps you when you have an optimal amount, if you have too much, it can still definitely be a problem. Um, but that's kind of more because your body's compensating for that massive increase of dopamine with other things rather than the dopamine itself from my perspective. But anyway, dopamine is the main thing that gives you desire. So um, we do have a dopamine report. Uh, we also have a sexual function, dysfunction report. So for instance, uh, I'm looking at my sexual dysfunction now. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about sexual dysfunction, uh, yeah, as can, it says, can yeah, you say yeah, really what we're here. what we're relating that to? Yeah. Yeah, um, it can be you know several different things, but as you can see, the way that we describe sexual function, this report is related to mental or physical functions like desire, arousal, orgasm, satisfaction, pleasure. So I'd say you know all that all comes under the kind of bracket of libido and. I guess the enjoyment of the experience itself as well. Um, as you can see here in this report, it says about 40% of differences in people's chances of developing sexual dysfunction may be due to genetics. So that's a little bit non-committal language there. Obviously more research needs to be done, but it's kind of like a ballpark figure, um, about 40%. So 40%, that's interesting, right? That's significant. So that means the level of sex drive that you have and enjoyment of sex, about 40% of that is purely down, like that was already decided for you before you were born. That's something that most people probably wouldn't have suspected, right? They would think it's, you know, like their own choice or maybe down to, you know, lifestyle and environmental factors. So again, there's something interesting, I would say, to, to know and to be aware of. Uh, you know, some other stats in here, um, you know, it talks about for men, obviously, a lack of desire can correlate with, with direct child dysfunction which is why it's mentioned here. For women, it's you know more lack of sexual desire, like I was saying. So that's why it talks about here, um, you know, the amount that of people have uh, lack of sexual desire. I was going to say the, the um, over on the right hand side, it said looking at over sixteen thousand genetic variants. So that is really interesting to me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know. A lot of other, I'm glad you brought that up. So a lot of other companies, they'll literally look at one genetic variant, one SNP they called, and then tell you a load of stuff about yourself from that. That's not always wrong. And in fact, we do that sometimes as well. Sometimes, 
Like if you want to know, you know, your level of specific nutrient that you need or something like that, maybe just one gene will tell you that. Um, and there are there are cases of that. But if you're talking about something general, like how healthy is your heart, your chances of anxiety, your chances of stress, and yes, your chance of sexual dysfunction, there's a lot of things that could cause sexual dysfunction. So of course, it would make sense that you would want to analyze a lot of different genetic variants in order to to ascertain whether that uh, may be a risk for a specific person. And so as you say, yeah, 16,265 genetic variants. Um, so that's definitely one report that I would look at if uh, you know you wanted to evaluate your libido. And you can see again, so this is my report here, Chrissy. Um, I'm in the sixth percentile, so that means you know, in a room of 100 people, I would be in the six least likely to have an issue with this. Again, not a boast, I have loads of other problems, but this just happens to be one that I don't have much of an issue with. Um, and it explains why, as I said, even when I was really unhealthy and weak and, you know, lost weight and all these horrible health problems, it's like one of the only problems, I, <laughs> the only areas of my body I didn't have a health problem with. Um, <laughs> and so again, you know, I, I, could, I could go, oh, well, aren't I like, masculine or whatever no matter what it's but all no, relative it's, to do with that. it's just genetic lottery exactly yeah and it just so happens that with my genetics that's the way it is and i would not say you know if that's one of the first places that problems show up for you if you're watching this i don't think that makes you any less masculine or fair feminine or whatever it's again it's just the genetic lottery that shows up for you there and not for not somewhere else and you know as i said i think it's good to know that um, so we do also have a report on dopamine itself, uh, which I'm just sharing with you now as well. And so, as I say, dopamine is like the primary um, hormone of uh, of uh, desire. And sorry, not hormone. It's the primary neurotransmitter which um, creates desire. And so, with this one, um, we don't list the amount of genetic variants that we're looking at, but we're specifically looking at the genetic variants around. Uh, one gene, um, which is uh, the ANKK1, which, as it says here, controls the activity of uh, dopamine. And we're looking at one variant specifically that is the most um, impactful that we list here, but I, I'm pretty sure we do evaluate other ones. Anyway, so if a person has a tendency for low dopamine, which again, we can see in this case, I don't. Mine is typical on the high side of typical. But if a person does have that low tendency towards dopamine, they will probably, not only will they have a tendency towards a low sex drive, they're probably going to have a tendency towards a low drive in general. And they, so as well as, so dopamine controls words like desire, passion, enthusiasm, drive, uh, motivation. But it also, uh, the other main thing I would say that um, controls is like clarity. So that ability to think clearly and that ability to focus. And what's the connection? The connection is um, you tend to focus on something you want. <laughs> so that's why. Um, if you don't want anything that much, then you tend to not be focused on anything that much. Um, so that's the connection. Now, again, when I say that, I'm talking about very, um, this is on a very animalistic level. You might want something in theory in your head, like intellectually want something, but I'm talking about more of a gut level, wanting it at the core of your body. And so, yeah, if you don't have strong desires, then often it is hard to focus. So that's the connection between the two. So anyway, if you have a tendency towards low dopamine in general, um, from my experience, you know, one of two things is possible. Either you just accept that, and you are just a person who is like, eh, about life, not bothered, you know? If you have that tendency for low dopamine with high levels of stress chemicals, then you might be someone whose entire life revolves around avoiding things rather than attaining things, right? So it might be, you know, you might run your life on stress. Maybe you run your life on to-do lists, but it's all about, you know, all the crises you're trying to avert rather than all the goals you're trying to achieve. Like achieving goals, achieving targets, winning all of that kind of stuff is more dopamine stuff whereas avoiding stress, fear yeah you know, fear based not is having more like, this terrible thing happen yeah stress yeah so fear is more adrenaline or adrenaline cortisol rather than dopamine um and then the other option with dopamine if you have low dopamine and what i see a tendency for is uh, you may well not accept that you have low dopamine and so therefore you constantly try and stimulate dopamine and how does a person stimulate dopamine really through what are known as addictive behaviors. So that can either be directly, which could be through 
um, drugs that increase dopamine. A lot of them do. Some of them increase dopamine very uh, specifically and obviously, like uh, cocaine and amphetamine, things like that. Some of them do it more indirectly. Most, basically anything that you look forward to and desire, like a drug, will stimulate it. You know, alcohol, cannabis, tobacco, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, but all kinds of other addictions can do it. You know, sex addiction, uh, shopping addiction, porn addiction, gaming addiction, work addiction, uh, any kind of addiction will stimulate dopamine. And so if you have an addictive personality, as they know it, often that's uh, an attempt to make up for a lack of dopamine. Not always, it can be other stuff, but you know, it's, it's one of those things. So if you have a low sex drive, but you have a very addictive personality, then you could look at dopamine. And how do you increase dopamine? We talk about that in a different episode, so I don't want to get too far into that. Um, but dopamine really is the driver of libido, to go back to that. The other driver of libido, of course, is just that you don't have things stopping <laughs> the libido. Um, on a biochemical level, you know, the primary thing that antagonizes dopamine or counteracts it, maybe is a better way of looking at it, um, would be prolactin. So I mentioned that earlier, I, you know, I, I have a tendency, I think, for high dopamine and high prolactin. So they kind of cancel each other out. Um, but prolactin is your anti-libido, anti-motivation, anti-clarity hormone. And so if you have a genetic tendency to high prolactin, um, or if you just have high prolactin, then that could be another reason why you're lacking sufficient libido. It might not be that you don't have enough dopamine, it might be you have too much prolactin. Is that more um, common in men or women, having too high prolactin? Women. And it's especially common, so the reason it's called prolactin is because it originally they discovered it in relation to lactation. So this is an interesting one. Um, I don't see anyone talk about this, I'm sure someone has put it together and I just haven't seen it. Um, but when women are pregnant, they have high levels of progesterone, really, really, really high, especially if they're healthy. And so progesterone is a really powerful anti-stress chemical. Then uh, women give birth, and then as you, you give birth, you switch from gestating a child to feeding the child. And so you go from progesterone, gest meaning gestate, so you go from gestating to prolactin, which is prolactation. Now, progesterone is very strongly anti-stress, while prolactin is a stress hormone that counteracts dopamine, which kind of gives you your motivation and joy in life. So is it any wonder that women who go from like a massive level of an anti-stress hormone to a massive level of an anti-joy hormone often suffer from postpartum depression and stress. As I said, no one seems to be talking about this. I think it's because maybe, you know, the last thing you want to be doing in a, in a new mother is lowering prolactin because that means she's not gonna be able to breastfeed her baby. But I would say from a particular perspective, the, the number one sacrifice that women make in having children experientially might not actually be growing this baby inside of you and having it ripped out of you um, with all the damage it causes on the way and all the rest of it, as, as much as that may be terrible and traumatic for some women, many women, the worst part of it might actually be the breastfeeding where you have to be you know, in this extremely low progesterone, high prolactin state, which frankly is miserable. You know, it's, it's miserable to be in that state. Now, the other thing is you should also be being flooded by oxytocin. And oxytocin is another important hormone and also very relevant when it comes to libido. So I'm gonna talk about it next. So if you're flooded with both prolactin and oxytocin, yeah, then yes, you don't have dopamine. So you don't have the motivation, the joy, the energy, the clarity and all the rest of it, but it shouldn't matter because you should be in a fluffy cloud of fulfillment and bliss and love. But that's only if you're in an environment that's conducive to that. If you also have to be goal oriented, for instance, you have to go back to work, you don't have any support looking after the child, then you've got to get stuff done. Maybe, you know, maybe you don't have to go back to work, but you have a big to-do list of cleaning and cooking and this and this and this. Then I can see how it'd be very easy to get into this very negative state um, 
and I don't mean to go too dark, but you know, like I was talking to a friend about like uh, you know women who uh, infanticide, who think about infanticide, and they couldn't comprehend it. And I said, I don't think it's as uncommon as you think. And I looked it up statistically. I think it's at seven percent of women like report having these kind of feelings after birth. And as I said, I don't. I'm not that surprised. And also. Um, I, I see biochemically how it could happen because if you're used to being in this really wonderfully anti-stress state with the high progesterone and then you suddenly have this anti-joy state with the prolactin but for whatever reason you don't have high enough oxytocin and again some women have a genetic tendency to low oxytocin so that could be one reason why you have uh, low oxytocin um, then I can see that life could be pretty miserable. And um, this is also why, you know, some the, the number one trauma that leads to suppressed thyroid function, which we talked about in a recent episode, um, is uh, childbirth in women. And I think it's not just the childbirth. I think it's also, and I, you know, I know practically also there's the lack of sleep and the constant demands and all the rest. I'm, I'm not discounting any of that either. Um, once you've got a newborn baby, I'm saying all of that on top of having like really high prolactin, um, and therefore low dopamine, I can see how that's a cocktail for uh, feeling seriously bad potentially, especially if that oxytocin is not high. We're gonna take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code REJUVENATE. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code REJUVENATE for 20% off today. I'm so glad you brought up the episode on the thyroid of Wilson's that we just did because you made that that point so so well about the thyroid and I can't remember specifically in the moment so please go back and watch the episode but it was really understanding that how all of these hormones interact and interplay and it can be such a domino and for women that you know this is supposed to be the most beautiful wonderful time of their life to then potentially not have the hormones where they should be to help get them through this because of course it's not that it's uh, prolactin's fault it's just that's what it is it's what it does but when, when it's out of balance and that symphony of hormones are not you know if they didn't show up for work that day and it's just prolactin well of course you're going to be miserable so understanding that and I think that's also the point too of people being able to hear this women being able to hear this husbands being able to hear this and seeing their friends their family their partner their wives you know go through this and understand oh hang on a second we need to look at your thyroid we need to look at your oxytocin we need to look at all of these things to make sure and support you where you need the support because i don't think people understand this enough yeah and progesterone absolutely yeah 100 percent. i agree um i wish I wish more people uh, were aware of it. And, you know, the more I have studied in um, about the hormones specifically, the more I, I think it's increased my compassion for women, like understanding you guys do get a raw deal um, in some ways, you know, um, reproductively specifically. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying men don't also have uh, their raw deals, but, um, uh, you know, I think specifically around... Uh, how difficult it is to reproduce for women, basically. I mean, I've already talked a lot about what it is, not just on a physical level, 
uh, you know, the toilet takes in the body, having all your internal organs squashed, for instance, having this baby growing inside you. I think, you know, that's a significant thing, for instance, the whole digestive system, all of that kind of stuff, so on a physical level. But yeah, really more on an emotional, experiential level with that hormone roller coaster. Um, it's got to be tough. And I think that's why... Um, I don't know if it's considered, you know, insulting or patriarchal by some women, but I just think that men should understand how difficult that is and do their best to um, support women through that process, understand the uh, sacrifice that they are making to continue life on earth. Absolutely. Very good point. Yeah, a very good point. Because as well, too, not only can it potentially be one of the hardest, especially the first time around changes that couples are going through, then you've got the biochemical hormonal as aspect that the woman is going through. Then you've also got, hang on a minute, Wiz, there's a whole new life in here. So that dynamic is changing within the relationship. I mean, it's like a perfect storm going on. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, some people might be reductive about this and say, hey, look, you know, human beings have been managing this for whatever, hundreds of thousands of years or whatever it is you believe. And uh, yeah, I get that. But, you know, human beings have also been suffering and struggling for a long time. And I guess that's what we're talking about. We're just talking about the, the suffering and the struggling element that, um, you know, in many ways, our life is easier and better in terms of, you know, the chance of dying of a violent death, I think, used to be one in three throughout most of our history. Now it's whatever it is, one in a thousand, one in 10,000. So in some ways, our life got better. And I guess that's especially improving for men, right? Because men were in charge of security before. And, you know, so you had to constantly be on the lookout that you weren't about to be eaten or killed by someone. And so, you know, unless you're in a country where there is a war, or you have to be part of a war, which I know is still going on right now, then men still get the raw deal in that regard. But um, if you're not, then you're not getting that raw deal. But women do still get this raw deal you know, reproductively, um, hormonally, I would say, and should be supported. Uh, just like men should be supported if they have to go to war or, you know, face violence in order to, uh, you know, protect their communities. And compassion and support, yeah, for sure. Big, big, big aspects of this. Yeah, so we've talked about the uh, I want kind of element of libido. We've talked about the what might dampen that. We've also talked about the I receive element of libido. Let's just talk about one more dimension. And we did mention it there already when we did the digression on reproduction. Um, and it's oxytocin. So of course, I want, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm open to it. It's all very, uh, what's the word? Transactional, mechanical. There is also that part of um, like feeling like an actual connection. Um, I think I read recently, like from a feminist writer that one of the biggest mistakes men make is thinking that sex is something they do to you rather than do with you. <laughs> and I think that's uh, probably 100% accurate. And so um, that feeling of actual connection and uh, empathy and compassion and all the rest of it, which uh, is an aspect of libido. Uh, I think, you know, for instance, a lot of men talk about performance anxiety. Maybe we'll talk about that again in a different context later. Um, but I think part of performance anxiety for a man is simply that lack of connection, that lack of oxytocin. So there's that men are also conflicted in various ways. And I'd say this is one of them. So on one hand, men like want newness. They're more inclined to um, design new partners. And, you know, some people say that they're more equipped to deal with newness as well. But uh, plenty of them suffer from performance anxiety, which to me is like an indication that it's not ideal. Um, to be having a lot of new partners. And of course, the main problem with someone new, you know, someone new may or may not be more desirable, but because they are new. So dopamine, let me just explain that for a second, actually. So newness is just dopamine stimulating in general, not just a new partner, a new anything, uh, a, new, uh, a new book, a new routine. This is like social media, you know, whenever you see a notification, that's a new thing that stimulates dopamine. So newness in general, novelty in general stimulates dopamine. So if you add that to the reproductive process, then yeah, newness is stimulating. I think it's actually probably just as stimulating to women as men. It's just that women are more cautious because of their biology and you know whatever other societal reasons. Um, but you know, newness is stimulating. But newness is also fear-inducing, right? And so oxytocin, I would say, is the aspect of libido, which is connection, which is um, I desire you or I desire this experience because I feel comfortable with you, because I feel safe with you, because I trust you. 
And I think that's an element of libido which is not much focused on, especially in the scientific community. Although oxytocin was like much later to be researched, for instance, than things like dopamine and adrenaline and serotonin. Um, but it's really important. And, you know, there is some research into it now, thank God. And we do understand more and more about oxytocin. So... Uh, again, if you have a genetic tendency for low oxytocin, and I meet plenty of people who do, you tend to match a specific profile. You tend to be not easily fulfilled. That's the main thing I notice about them. Um, so it's a bit different from the, I said, the the people with addictive tendency tend to have low dopamine, and they're like trying to, by doing things that stimulate dopamine, they're, tr they're trying to make themselves feel more, more dopamine. With the oxytocin, it's more like a, a low level of oxytocin makes you feel kind of emptiness inside. And also kind of aloneness, a lack of connection. I'm all alone. I feel empty and I'm all alone. I guess that's the fundamental low oxytocin feeling. And the opposite of that, of course, is I feel fulfilled. So I feel an overflowing feeling instead of an emptiness. And I feel connected. I feel connected to you. I feel connected to humanity. I feel connected to the universe. I feel connected to God. I feel connected to nature, whatever it is, right? I feel connected. And so when you do not feel alone and when you do not feel empty, um, you obviously feel better in general. Everything, there's a benefit to everything. So if you do have a genetic tendency for low oxytocin, if you see that in the reports, one of the positive things I can say about you is they tend to be people who actually get a lot done um, because they never feel fulfilled. So um, actually, honestly, I see workaholics, I see workaholics even more commonly among low oxytocin people than I do low dopamine people because they're, they're constantly you know, striving for that fulfillment. Like dopamine people often get more into the trap of addictive behavior, like gaming or porn or shopping or social media or whatever. Whereas low oxytocin people especially really do seem to be like often working or volunteering or like they're really trying to do something to make themselves fulfilled in many cases. Sometimes it's just overeating, don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> but often it's like positive stuff. And so, um, and sometimes it's sex addiction, because that, that kind of hits dopamine and, and oxytocin all at once. But anyway, um, so oxytocin is another dimension of libido. I would say that's like the fourth element that I would be looking at. So I'd be looking at dopamine. Other than just libido itself, that libido report, I'm going to be looking at dopamine. I'm going to be looking at prolactin. I'm going to be looking at um, oxytocin. And I'm going to be, uh, yeah. And yeah, that was actually the other one. Yeah, the sexual desire. So yeah, those would be the uh, the primary things that I would look at for, for libido. And so yeah, the other thing that I would add, the, the fourth thing, um, other than dopamine itself, one of the, as I said earlier, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that changes quite quickly. It's hard to measure. The primary hormone I'm looking at for dopamine is testosterone in both men and women. So the reason why it testosterone is associated in sex drive with both men and women. One of the main reasons, one of the reasons because it's anti-stress. So by reducing the fear element, the moving away from element, the move towards element of dopamine can increase. Second of all, it is dopamine agonist in and of itself, both testosterone and DHT. It's stronger metabolite. So testosterone and DHT, which is a version of testosterone, strongly agonize, which means kind of stimulate dopamine. And so that would be the other thing I'd look at. So testosterone, free testosterone, and DHT would all indicate dopamine as well to me, especially the sexual aspect of it. Right. Okay. So then, so then let's say somebody's got a report, they've got the tendency for low dopamine, low testosterone, low oxytocin, like there's, you know, and and they may be suffering in this area. They can, you know, take take something away from that of going, oh, hang on a minute. Let me look at these areas and see what I can potentially do externally with um, what my next steps may be to help my genetic along. Absolutely. And I won't spend too long focusing on this, but, you know, that is something that we include in our reports as well. Um the reports not only give you the risk, but they give recommendations. So for instance, in this case, I'm looking at the um, dopamine report, and I can see the first recommendation that this person got, which is me, <laughs> actually is uh, the first thing that I'd probably recommend to someone who has low dopamine, which is to give uh, you more of the building block that makes dopamine, which is the amino acids uh, L-tyrosine, or less directly, but still relevant, um, L-phenylalanine. These are amino acids which is constituents of protein that your body turns into dopamine. So that's why 
you know, when I uh, helped to formulate a libido strengthening supplement, which I did, um, that's one of the things I included was L-tyrosine because it is the building block for dopamine. So that would be a good recommendation. And, you know, you can see if you're looking at the report, I'm just scrolling through. There are other things, aerobic exercise, um, yoga, meditation, all these things are in here. And you can see all the little R's next to it. I'm not sure if it's zoomed in enough for you to see it, but... Uh, basically every little R here is uh, linked to a study. So the, we're including things here which um, there is evidence, scientific evidence that it is effective. Sunlight, you can see here is number five. I think that's probably partly due to vitamin D3, but there's a lot more to it. You know, different frequencies of light will uh, stimulate dopamine in through various different mechanisms. And again, you can either take our word for it and just get more sunlight or if you want to go to the research you can click on all these links and read the studies and find out all the details about how it all works. Thank you for that Owen. I'm glad you um, shared that the reports do offer those recommendations because that is something to, to look to especially when you know if you decide to go down this process. If you don't get the genetic reports there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot on our podcast so make sure you watch those other episodes and you know so that there is there are things that you can do and that's what we really want to make everyone aware of. But you know thank you that that libido section was very comprehensive. <laughs> it's much appreciated. <laughs> And I think we, we did quite a bit on fertility as well. So our next section is, you know, as we're going to dive into sexual function and dysfunction and how our genes impact that. So kick us off here, Owen, where we're we going to start. Well, you know, I'd say the main thing is really erectile dysfunction. We've really talked, I think, sexual function for women. Um, we talked about how potentially a lack of um, lubrication can be a practical issue. And we talked about how uh, often estrogen can be effective for that. So we've really kind of covered that. Um, as I said, that's rarely an issue of a lack of estrogen. Like even if you, even if as a woman you have a tendency towards low estrogen, it's probably not gonna be low enough to cause that problem in and of itself until you start to be at least premenopausal. So that's really not what it is. If you have a lack of, um, you know, lubrication, I would say, in, sufficient enough that it blocks you having sex before premenopause and that's really going to be more of a libido issue that's more my understanding so that's why we've really focused on libido a lot um but when it comes to sexual function i'd say let's go more to men they're more the ones that are the issue of that and focus on erectile dysfunction um so obviously libido can be an issue for men and we've discussed that in quite a lot of uh, depth as well but what i think is the most common is you want to you have the desire to but you can't and this is a problem which is, um, I think, always existed for men, but it is significantly increased. And in fact, it's, you know, maybe it used to happen commonly to 80-year-old men, and then a few decades ago, it became much more common among 60-year-old men, and then 50, and then 40, and now even many guys in their 20s are suffering with it. Uh, I think there's a few different reasons for that. I was going to say, why do you think that is such the decline, that it's getting earlier and earlier and earlier for us, for men? Yeah, I think there's a few different reasons for that. Um, let's talk about the non-genetic ones first before we look at genetics. So um, I think one of them is that men are just generally less healthy. So as we said, and people people are generally less healthy, including men. So as we said... Depending on your genetics, when you the less healthy you are, it's going to show up in more and more places. If you're 98% of optimum, then you might just have your very highest risk areas that you're suffering with. But once you're 80% optimal, it's going to be even your high risk areas. Once you're 60% op optimal, even your medium risk areas you're going to start having problems with. And once you're 20% optimal, you're going to start having problems pretty much everywhere that your genetics suggest that you could have problems with. Does that make sense? So just generally less healthy means you're generally more likely to, statistically. Now, specifically, I also think that there are specific things that men are doing which are, are elevating the risk of it significantly. Uh, one is um, all of the hair loss drugs. So finasteride and all the rest of it, they work by um, blocking DHT. So DHT is a form of testosterone that is way more androgenic. If you look up uh, side effects of finasteride or post-finasteride syndrome, you will see that uh, 
erectile dysfunction, lack of libido, and all the rest of it are frequent side effects. Uh, this is because DHT, more than testosterone, is actually your primary um, sex drive and also even sexual function hormone. Not everyone knows that. Some people even disagree. Uh, they say it's testosterone. But if I have experienced personally myself, and I've seen the research behind it, that even though it's not as common, if a person has high testosterone and low DHT, they can still have issues of sexual function. So it really is the DHT that is more crucial um, than the testosterone. And so if you're taking drugs that block DHT, that can certainly do it. I think that's one reason. Another reason, and again, I'm not saying not to take those drugs, but I'm... Oh, sorry, I've got a, a big point to make here too. Is it because, you know, as I've worked on, you know, your other company, talking to gentlemen that have definitely had some, you know, physical issues in that area and, you know, asking them, you know, what are you taking certain medications? And like, absolutely, yes. And I said, well, do you realize that that medication is impacting your performance ability? I said, well, I'm not going to stop taking that. Not, I'm just, you know, my hair is too important for me. And I'm like, well, okay, but how can we, how can we get around this then? You know, so it's like just <laughs> felt it's such an impasse because, well, there's not much else I can offer except for, you know, more lifestyle and like, okay, let's get the gut right. Let's get the thyroid right. Let's get all that stuff right. But if you've got this thing that's, that's just not going to allow you to do it, I don't know how else I can help you. Yeah, I, it's a tricky one because, of course, putting your appearance, caring about your appearance is fine and, you know, it's perfectly masculine. But putting your appearance above everything, even your ability to experience sexual satisfaction, to sexually satisfy your partner, mm, it seems quite unmasculine to me. But then again, criticizing someone for being unmasculine when they're taking a drug that makes them unmasculine is kind of counterproductive right so you're literally taking a drug which makes you which suppresses the number one androgenic or masculine hormone in the body dht of course you're going to have a perspective that is less masculine i mean people talk about this with women you know they take birth control drugs and then their sexual um what's the word who they're sex sexually attractive to changes so women on birth control uh, they are more attractive to uh, more attracted to men with less masculine traits than women on not birth control. So you're attracted to who you're attracted to. Attraction isn't a choice, but making changes to your bio to your biology and your hormones is a choice, and it's a choice you can choose to make. Now I'm not telling anyone to get off birth control because unwanted children, I think, is an extremely bad thing. Uh, I'm not telling anyone even to get off hair loss drugs um, because going cold turkey on anything without supervision can be a really bad idea. But I'm just saying it's a choice. So hair loss drugs would be one of them. Opiates is another big one that will absolutely kill uh, erectile, dis uh, erectile function, partly through raising prolactin and for a bunch of other mechanisms as well. Um, SSRIs, antidepressants that increase serotonin, will absolutely... That can be one of the side effects. I think it's so well known, it's a cliche. Um, one that's not well known, but which I like to mention and raise awareness of is antihistamines. Um, histamine is an essential part of getting an erection. And if you are taking antihistamines, then they may be working at whatever allergy, the reason you take them, but they can have that side effect uh, of reducing uh, the ability to uh, get an erection. Yeah, uh, I, I think the person I first came across that from is Hans Amoto, who we had on the show recently. Um, he's got a great article on his website where he goes through the research on that uh, in detail. But basically, you know, I don't know if you've heard of mast cells and um, uh, how histamine is released from these mast cells. This, this thing called mast cell activation syndrome, which I think we do an episode on at some point where people are kind of allergic to everything. Well, anyway, that's the, the, the local ones around the penis are exactly, you know, the mechanism by which, um, uh, you know, an erection happens. It's a big deal. And so if you're, if you're restricting that, it's, it's going to maybe not cause erectile dysfunction, but probably exacerbate. Um, so that's, a, you know, another one. Um, 
what else off the top of my head. Maybe that, you know, that's enough of an example, uh, unless I, so another one pops in. But, you know, so there are all these drugs that people commonly take. I mean, a lot of people are on at least one of those. Um, and antihistamines aren't only for allergies. Uh, a lot of people are also on antihistamines for uh, stomach acids. So if you have acid reflux and all that, you might be on antihistamine without realizing it. So basically, you know, I just named a lot of the categories of the drugs that uh, a lot of men are on. So I think just that could be an answer. If we add that plus general health, plus then we add in more lifestyle things like pornography and even beyond pornography, just constant sexual stimulation. It used to be, uh, you know, the only naked woman you're likely to ever see would be, you know, at least someone who lived near you. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> even if it's not only your wife or husband as a man, um, you're not going to be seeing anyone who lives, you know, more than whatever ho horse and cart distance away. And, you know, now we're just bombarded with uh, sexual imagery, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, women who you never meet in real life and up close as well. So an interesting thing about like, even just seeing someone's face, like, just seeing, for instance, the color of someone's eyes. Normally, the only way you would even know what eye color someone is is because you were having an intimate conversation with them. You'd have to be quite close to them physically in order to know that about them. Now, you know, we see movie stars on screen and you can see, you know, every you know, line and certainly the color of their eyes and all the rest of it. And it's, you know, it's, it's normal to get this intimate look at all kinds of people. So anyway, all of this overstimulation. Dopamine, we've done a whole episode on this, so I won't go into detail definitely check out our dopamine episode. But, um, you know, in a nutshell, dopamine is very much a down-regulating hormone neurotransmitter, meaning the more you try and stimulate it, the more your body goes, uh-uh-uh, we're not having high, higher amounts of it. It just reduces it. Either reduces the level of dopamine you're making, it um, reduces the sensitivity of the dopamine receptors. Like, it does something that basically means that next time it's going to take more to stimulate you. So the more you try and stimulate yourself with things that stimulate dopamine, the more difficult it becomes to stimulate yourself. Um, so men, I think, easily get to a place where they are so overstimulated because they have more access, as I said, to imagery and all the rest of it than ever before. Uh, it doesn't just have to be porn. It could be Instagram. It could be, you know, movies. It can be whatever. That, um, that they are just overstimulated and it takes too much to stimulate them. And so that can lead to erectile dysfunction as well. Um, and all of that is more not even getting into the biggest factor, which I'll get into, which is the issue of circulation itself. So this is something that we did a whole episode on, uh, but in a nutshell, you know, cardiovascular health is, or cardiovascular ill health is the number one or number two killer in most countries. What that means is that blockages in the uh, arteries get so severe that there's a good chance they'll end up killing you. And so way before that, usually those blockages of the arteries can get to the point where there's lack of blood flow to uh, the extremities. Extremities can be, you know, the brain, uh, it can be the skin, um, you know, it can be the, the, the hands and feet. So it can show up in different ways, but it can be the penis, you know, it's very much an extremity. And so a lack of blood flow to there um, is probably the number one cause. It's only the number one cause if it's um, independent of circumstance. So if you get it sometimes and not other times and all the rest of it, then other factors that I mentioned can be more of a factor. Um, now, even if you always get it, it can still certainly be any of the drugs we mentioned earlier that can be a cause. So you want to rule those out as well. Uh, but probably the most common cause, because it is also probably the most common cause of death, is just a blockage of the arteries. And this is a big deal. This is you know, one of the reasons why I say, if a person has erectile dysfunction, if a man has erectile dysfunction, he says, I'm otherwise healthy. It's the most common email I get from these people who ask me about this, is I'm otherwise healthy, but, and I think what they mean is they maybe they have a healthy lifestyle-ish, which is fine, but which is great. But you have to understand that it's rare that this is the very first symptom that you get. If it's caused by a drug side effect or um, you know stress or something, then maybe. But if it's caused by arterial blockage, that means that that arter which is the most common reason, then it means that arterial blockage is already quite far along, and that's something to really pay attention to before it comes something more serious. And just forcing the blood flow in, 
either with a drug or with even a supplement that does that. It is a temporary solution, potentially. It is not a risk-free or side effect-free solution, especially the drug form. Um, but what it definitely isn't is resolving the issue. And so, you know, one of the products that help formulate Cardio Shield, which I think we talked about in our cardiovascular health episode, that is more of a solution purely in terms of like a pill you can take. But of course, the real, real solution is to work out why your um, body is building up more and more blockage in your arteries in the first place. And that's something that we do talk about in depth in that cardiovascular health episode, like really um, working out what is the root cause and addressing those root causes, which I would say is very important. You made a really good point too, as well about the forcing the issue and using potential, you know, drugs or pharmaceuticals to assist with that because, okay, sure, maybe it might work for a couple of times, but it it doesn't mean that it's going to continue. And again, the issue is still there. That's the other part. It's like for people to correlate, oh, it, taking this pill has not fixed the big issue. Okay, yes, I can potentially, because sometimes it doesn't help everybody, and not that it's helping, but it's getting you to where you, th you want to be right there in that moment. But there's, there's more of an underlying thing that has to, that you have to figure out and um, how can I say this, you know, get to the, like you said, get to that root cause to unearth it, you know, unpack it, figure out there's, there's changes that need to be made because, um, the, the other part of it too, is like where you say, you know, I'm otherwise healthy, but, and that's the other thing. So much of all of this, we get to certain ages, we think, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. But there's this little thing that's not working. There's that little thing that's potentially not working. It's, it's like this slow, how can I say, you know, the slow, not, the thing that it's just where suddenly you hit a certain age and it's suddenly if you feel like everything's just creeped up on you, but that's not the case. It's your body, little things have been going on. So it's about paying attention and, and figuring it out. I wanted to ask you or bring up another point that I've come across, especially when I've been talking to certain gentlemen, you know, that are reaching out to the other company is um, when they've had surgeries things like that that have impacted their, you know, I know we're really looking at genetic aspects here, but that that's a, something I've come across too, is where they have had, you know, either prostate cancer or, you know, things like that, or they've had surgeries and there have been, been issues that come along with that as well. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't say too much about that. Like, this is really where, you know, you do need a doctor like, I mean, you need a doctor in general, but the time you definitely need a doctor is once a doctor has already been cutting you open and, and doing stuff to you. And I know that sometimes that is the best thing to do. I'm not criticizing it, but I'm saying that I, I feel pretty confident to be able to provide some help to most people, but I can understand why you're asking the question because that's often the hardest person to help. The hardest person to help is the one who's had the most medical interventions. Now, you could just say that's because they've had the most problems, which have meant they need medical interventions. But yeah, the more medical interventions, interventions you've had, the more you really need a doctor to help you because they're the only ones who understand what you can do, still do despite having those uh, medical interventions. So unfortunately, I have to refer you to a doctor for that one. But to go back to erectile dysfunction, um, there is a genetic component. And so this is something I think like most men don't know. So if I'm looking at my report here, for instance, and as you can see, it says about 40% of differences in people's chances of developing erectile dysfunction may be attributed to genetics. And then it gives a list of, you know, again, links to studies of different genetics. And it says, uh, genes involved may influence hormones, blood flow, and feel good brain chemicals, which, you know, we just mentioned those, right? Dopamine and oxytocin as an example. So it's everything that we've just talked about, right? And if I scroll up a little bit, you can see, now remember I said this was not something I had an issue with. Um, so you can see, you know, in this case, I'm in the fourth percentile, so extremely unlikely to have it. And this, this is the only reason why, despite having fairly severe health issues a few years ago, I didn't have a problem with it. But again, if you're not in that fourth percentile, if you're in that 96th percentile, then you could be one of those people who it's one of the first things you have a problem with. And that's the person who is most justified in sending me that email to go, I don't have any other health issues, but, you know, and maybe they're right. Actually, it is one of the first places it's shown up for them uh, because there is a genetic component to that. Now, we said only 40% of the difference is genetic, but you've got to stack that on top of the um, 
uh, genetic tendency. So what I mean by that is, yeah, you know, usually it's like 40, 50% of it is genetic. That's kind of the average of what I see. But let's say if you are in the top 2% most likely to suffer an issue, then uh, even if only 40% of it is genetic, you're still quite likely to suffer from that issue unless you really are pretty optimal, if that makes sense. And so that's where that can be really helpful information. And of course, the other way it can be really helpful is that it gives recommendations um, which are specific to your, um, uh, spe you know, specific genetics. So we can just, I can't remember what mine are, but we can just have a look as an example of what mine says. Um, yeah, there's a big list here. So uh, cardiovascular exercise. So, you know, this is fairly obvious. There's loads of evidence that shows that this would help with the blood flow aspect that we talked about, the, the arterial blockage and stuff like that. Uh, sex therapy. So uh, this would be more focused on any psychological blockages, for instance. Um, practice exercise snacks. Yeah, that's not something I would put in number three, but I think it's indicating that for people with my genetics, um, it's uh, you know potentially a good idea, and it's showing again the, the research behind it um, with links, and uh, you know therapy again for psychological issues, and there we go. Eventually, avoiding cannabis um, that has actually been a big one for me. I know that wouldn't be that high on the list for a lot of people, but I am one of those people who genetically I'm more likely towards cannabis addiction. We have a report on that, and I have a high tendency for that. And then I, I frequently see this where cannabis will be more of a negative risk factor for me than it would perhaps for a lot of other people. Uh, the first herb that's recommended here is your himbine. Uh, pretty effective, but I don't include any formulas because it's far too risky for me compared to you know the benefit of it. Uh, and then arginine and citrulline would be another example. I prefer to use citrulline when I do formulas. Um, but they kind of both do the same thing. So that would help with the, uh, the temporary blood flow to the area, avoiding, avoiding opiates. I talked about that earlier. They're one of the things that suppress it. Shockwave therapy, I know they're becoming more, imp um, what's the word, uh, popular these days. People buy devices that kind of break up the plaque locally in that area specifically. Vitamin D, that's something that I mentioned earlier. So there's, you know, again, when I do, uh, a formula for this problem that is often something that I include that's effective. So you can see, you know, there's a combination of different lifestyle and supplement and diet and, you know, ginseng again for me, I guess that's one of them. So anyway, uh, it's helpful to have those recommendations as well that are specific to the genetics. Um, potentially you can recommend some things that you have never even heard of, as you saw for me there, number three. Uh, you've got to remember, I don't put all these reports together myself. There's a team of like, several dozen full-time scientists, research scientists, and several dozen full-time AI engineers who together are creating all of this and, uh, you know, collating the data and putting it together and linking, you know, um, uh, validating the research studies and, and compiling them and linking to them and all the rest of it. So, um, uh, you know, yeah, there's, there's always more than any one person can know 100%. But anyway, uh, that can be useful information, right? To see, you know, the f first of all, get your risk score for your genetics. And second of all, to, you know, perhaps get some uh, recommendations. For the other ma uh, big issue that men tend to suffer with performance-wise, premature ejaculation, um, we do not have a genetic report on that. But for that one, I would probably look at stress, which is why it is one of the um, things that I've included uh, a report for in the uh, in that particular category in genetic insights. Um, basically, stress plus dopamine, I would say, is the thing that leads to premature ejaculation. So, dopamine, as we talked about, is the neurotransmitter of desire. But here's the thing: too much dopamine can make you overexcited. It can make you pop too quickly, and so that's why. Increasing dopamine by increasing dopamine directly can be a double-edged sword. Yes, it will increase your desire. Yes, if there's nothing blocking you, it will make you more likely to also have an erection. But it will also, all other things being equal, increase the speed at which you ejaculate. And that's why testosterone, especially DHT, are much more helpful area to work on. Because testosterone and DHT do not only increase dopamine, they also increase GABA. And GABA is your 
calming, take it easy, chill man, don't get overexcited kind of uh, neurotransmitter um, for, for men and women. And so that will stop you from becoming overexcited too quickly. Um, so yeah, another report that, um, that we have in there is GABA. And I would look at GABA as well and say, if you have a tendency towards low GABA, for instance, and if you have a tendency towards high stress, um, if you have a tendency towards low DHT and low, low testosterone, all those things I would say would be risk factors for premature ejaculation. And those would be some of the first things that I would focus on. Uh, I did, you know, formulate a product for that as well, which, you know, people have told me have been, uh, has been very successful. It's only been out a few months, but people like it. And yeah, it's this, you know, it's the same, those are the, the same principles that I based it around. It which be, product is that? Uh, increasing GABA specifically. Um, that's one where I am a ghost formulator, so I'm not officially credited, so I won't mention it. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, you know, it, it uh, it's effective. And yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And um, for the company where I am, what's the word, publicly a formulator for it, we um, uh, do have a version as well, but it doesn't work with that same mechanism, GABA. It's more just a general anti-stress one. And that one is uh, called Go All Night. Um, and so, yeah, that one actually, that one has been around for years. I didn't formulate that primarily around GABA, which is why it isn't the first one I mentioned. Um, but yeah, that's probably second bestseller for that company. It's, you know, for many years, it's very popular. So a lot of guys do like that as well. But that's more generally anti-stress. And that's why, as I said, the first thing I look at is stress. Basically, if a person is has a tendency to PE, they are never a relaxed, chilled, easygoing person. They may act that way, but when I talk to them, they have some deep-seated anxiety. They, you know, they're on the verge of that panic and overwhelm. Like, if you're cool as a cucumber, then, and also if you're very under control, I'm not saying, not, uh, lasting a long time isn't always a sign of, you know, great health or great emotional health. It can be a sign that you are very self-controlling, which is also maybe not ideal. It can be a sign that you are rigid type in the uh, character types that we talked about a few months ago. It's not always a good thing, um, but certainly the opposite, like, you know, only lasting a, a few seconds or a minute or something like that is rarely a sign of health. That's a sign of um, that you are overstimulated. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah, you, um, you bring up a good point about, you know, like what we need to be able to achieve certain things. So, I mean, again, that's going back to, you know, the education of the understanding instead of just going, I just don't know what's going on. It's like you can follow through some of these things, which is really, really, really good and really important. So, yeah, if anybody, um, you know, we'll put the links below to some of the things that Owen discussed, especially about the goal night and some other, you know, the things that he's mentioned here, too, as best we can. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and we'll see what we can do. And we had a whole episode, I think, or part of a, a long part of an episode where we talked about how to increase GABA. So again, if people don't want to get our specific products, but they can they can work out their own strategies from those episodes to um, help to increase GABA and to lower that stress and that overstimulation, and that'll be very effective. Ellen, as always, this has been so, so, so informative. I know that there are still the two areas, the fertility and the potency and the reproduction that we have yet to go into detail and how our genetics impact that. So, you know, we haven't gotten there yet, ever, our listeners, our lovely listeners. So if you do want us to talk a little bit more about that, please let us know in the comments and then we'll be able to bring that to you at a later date. But um, for now, before we do close, Ellen, are there any final thoughts on the things that we have discussed today about genetics? and our um, sexual uh, function and reproduction. Yeah, I hope, you know, this episode has helped to reduce any stigma you have or judgment about yourself. Um, I realize very few people watching this probably have access to their genetic reports, but I hope just knowing that genetics could be a good part of it. And yes, you know, maybe you have an issue there, which is why you're watching or listening to this episode all the way through. Everyone has an issue somewhere. And, you know, for some other people, it's somewhere more of, of you know, obvious like maybe someone's got really bad rash on their face and they're very self-conscious about that i guess one benefit of this is at least it's something that you know not everyone immediately knows about you as soon as they see you um so i guess it's all relative so i hope that it helps you feel better about it i guess that's the point i hope it helps you realize that there's things you can do about it there may be things that you haven't tried there may be things that you're doing which are not helping like we talked about earlier um i would very much like to do the um episode on fertility 
and reproduction and potency and all the rest of it. So uh, please do leave comments. Let us know if you're interested in that. And if you are, we will do it. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time. And please share this with anyone who you feel would benefit from it or even be open to hearing about it. Fantastic. And again, everyone, we know your time is valuable and we love having you here. So thanks again for listening. Please make sure to leave us a review and we appreciate hearing your thoughts and, you know, keep asking us the questions because that helps inspire us to what we can bring to you next as well. So again, thanks for everything. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.